hyperbolic file. You got another minute or so. You can go into Blackboard and look at the files for today. They'll be under lecture notes and files used in class. Go ahead and download the two ZMAX files, cartesianovals.zmx and hyperbolicthinlens.zmx. people do we have here? We've got 17 people. Wait till 501. All right, let's get started. What we're going to talk about today is where Snell's Law comes from. So we're going to talk about the principle of least time. Then we're going to talk about lens shapes, which we can derive from the principle of least time. And then we'll start dealing with the thin lens equation. Um, also, in the second half of class, we'll do a lot of ZMAX work. Oh, I see a question in the chat. Which file did I say to open? Um, you can start by opening cartesianovals.zmx, but we're not going to use those for a while. Uh, you download hyperbolic thin lens.zmx and cartesianovals.zmx. Um, who has not yet gotten ZMAX to work? Andrew, anyone else? Okay, so there are some possible fixes that is it is it in Andrew's case, I believe it's just the Mac issue. Yeah, I uh, sent a request to the library today. They should get back to me on whether they can provide a laptop or not. Okay, the university can at least in some cases provide laptops. I don't know how many they have to offer but if you're using um a mac oh julian says that he has a mac and figured out how to make it work so andrew why don't you and julian um get in touch outside of class and uh see if julian's whatever tricks julian used will work in your situation otherwise the university might be able to provide a windows laptop Windows better than Mac. Yeah, we're not going to have that fight. We're just going to say that for ZMAX, Windows is easier to use. That's all we'll say. I'm not going to have that fight. <laughs> okay, so Snell's Law comes from something called Fermat's Principle of Least Time, which is one of the most elegant principles in physics. It actually ties into the principle of least action in Lagrangian mechanics, which some of you will be learning about this semester with Dr. Botana Alcalde. And that is definitely one of the most elegant things in physics. And a lot of this stuff was actually worked out for light before it was worked out for classical mechanics. But the basic idea is that if light is going from point A to point B, it will follow whichever path takes the least amount of time. So we have this situation here. 
I'll try to draw. In this situation here, we've got a large angle on the left. We've got a small angle on the right. Which medium has the higher refractive index? Which one's larger, N1 or N2? N1. Well, let's see here. N1 sine theta 1 should be N2 sine theta 2. In order for these two sides to be equal, if N is large, sine theta should be small. And sine theta is small on the left. So N must be large. And it turns out that of all the paths that light could take from point A to point B, the path that follows Snell's law is actually the path that takes the least time. If we have a small index of refraction, is the light going fast or slow? Uh, slower, right? A small index uh, of refraction? Faster. V is C over N. So if we divide by a small number, we have a high speed. If we divide by a large number, we have a low speed. Okay, so small n, fast light. Large n, slow light. Think about it this way. If um, the common metaphor for this is a lifeguard at the beach. If someone's drowning, all right, if the lifeguard is, so here's water, and here's sand, and here's our lifeguard, and here's our drowning swimmer. Does the lifeguard want to take the path I'm drawing in red here, run straight to the water, and then swim? Or does the lifeguard want to cover most of that distance on the sand where they can move quickly? On the sand. Yeah, they obviously want to cover most of that distance on the sand. There's an example, which I can't find now off the top of my head, but somebody did an experiment with ants where they put um, two different surfaces. Okay, so you've got your anthill here. And let's say that this is a fast medium. This is a surface that the ants can walk quickly on. And here's a slow medium. And they put some sugar over here. And insects are good, at least social, <clears throat> social insects are good at tracing out the path that other members of their group were following. And so the ants instinctively took a path like that. They don't do it on a single pass, but you know, they quickly worked out that the fastest path to get the sugar was a path that looks a lot like this. And sure enough, it obeyed Snell's law. If you were to calculate a refractive index for each side, asking, okay, what's their normal walking speed? Then what does their walking speed get divided by here and here? And sure enough, they followed Snell's law, all right? So in general, if you wanna get from point A to point B quickly, you wanna cover most of the distance in the fast medium and less of the distance in the slow medium. Now you might, not, you might say, well, why not just cover all of the distance or as much as possible in the fast medium? And the answer is that if you cover it as much as possible in here, then you increase the distance a lot. And increasing the distance also increases the time. If you minimize the distance, well, Minimizing the distance has a lot of advantages, but if you minimize the distance and you don't take into account anything else, then you wind up covering a lot of distance in the slow medium. And so the path followed by Snell's law will prove rigorously represents a trade-off. We can see qualitatively that it could plausibly represent a trade-off because you're covering dispropor well, disproportionately is the wrong word. You're covering percentage-wise more distance in the fast medium 
but you're not covering all of the distance in the fast medium. You are taking into account the fact that you don't want to just increase the distance more than necessary. And if this were just a mathematical curiosity, well, then maybe we wouldn't care so much, but it turns out that this helps us understand lens performance. Right, so the basic idea is this. We've got point A, we've got point B. We've got a medium with refractive index N1 and a medium with refractive index N2. And this distance here, I'm gonna call XA. And we'll say that this is Y equals zero. This is at Y equals H um, and X B. And this over here, this point here is X equals zero. So this is X A zero. This is X B H. And then the basic question is, what is the value of y at which they cross? What is the optimal value of y at which to cross? So we're going to call this yc. And we have to figure out the time to get from A to B. Well, that's going to be L1 over the speed in medium one, plus this distance L2 over the speed in medium two, which is L1 over C over N1, plus L2 over C over N2. And then in order to count, well, before we do that, one over one over N is N. So I could rewrite that as N1 L1 plus N2 L2 all divided by C. And this numerator is so important that they often just call this optical path length. It's not a literal path length. It's not a distance you could measure with a ruler because it got weighted by the refractive index but it shows up in so many calculations that they often call it optical path length. Now, how are we gonna figure out what L1 and L2 are in terms of this unknown crossing point, YC? Anyone? Anyone? Pythagorean. Pythagorean theorem, thank you. All right, so L1 is the square root of XA squared plus YC squared. And L2 is the square root of XB squared plus H minus YC squared. So if we put all this together, we've got the TAB is equal to one over C times big mess N1 square root of XA squared plus YC, oops, YC squared plus N2 square root of XB squared plus H minus YC squared. All right, now we need to minimize that time. How are we gonna do that? Take the derivative? Yep. All right, well, taking the derivative of a square root, the square root is a one half power, so we get a one half, and we get one over that square root. And we get 2yc because by the chain rule we have to take the derivative of yc squared. And likewise in the next term, we're again taking the derivative of a square root. So we get a one half, we get a one over a square root.
And then by the chain rule, we have to take the derivative of this thing underneath the square root sign. Well, that's another square. So we get a two H minus YC and we get a minus sign because of that minus sign. Any questions on how I did that? And don't worry, all of these notes will be made available after class. Okay. Well, these square roots in the denominator, that's just L1. And that square root is just L2. And the one halves cancel the twos. And then we've got YC over L1. Let's see here. YC over L1. Well, this height is also YC. YC is opposite theta one. L1 is a hypotenuse. So it looks like I've got one over C times N1 sine theta one. Hey, that's, that's nice. N sine theta, that showed up in Snell's law, which I just asserted as a fact last time. And then I've got H minus YC over L2. Well, let's see here. This is, this height here is H minus YC, and that's theta two. So H minus YC is opposite theta two. L2 is a hypotenuse. So I get minus N2 sine theta two. And if I wanna minimize the time, that derivative had better be zero. So I get that N sine, N1 sine sine theta one minus N2 sine theta two is zero. You say, what about the one over C? Well, it just cancels out because we could multiply both sides by C and we're multiplying zero by C. And so I'm left with N1 sine theta one equals N2 sine theta two. And it's this beautiful, elegant fact that light just somehow knows of all the possible paths to take from point A to point B, this is the path that will uh, take the least time. Now that doesn't mean that light starts off saying, hey, I wanna get to point B, all right? Light just goes in whatever direction your laser pointer or your light bulb or whatever sends it. But any light that's going to get from point A to point B will get there by the shortest possible path. And the ultimate reason for that is that light is ultimately a wave, even though we're not dealing with that right now. And waves spread out in all directions. But waves will only add up constructively. They'll only add up and reinforce each other if they all arrive at the same point in their cycle. You know, if they're all pointing up or they're all pointing down or they're all, you know, at half their amplitude but up or half their amplitude but down. They all have to be at the same point in their cycle, their cycle of oscillation, which means they all have to take the same amount of time to get there because all the different paths, the wave is oscillating at the same frequency. And so you only get constructive interference and hence get this sort of geometrical effect, this non-wave effect, this effect where we're not even thinking about the wave nature. If all of the waves are just naturally in sync so we don't have to think about the fact that some of them aren't, that some of them are taking different times. And that's why in this zoomed out picture of light where we're not thinking about the wavelength, that's why in the zoomed out picture, it follows the principle of least time because everything's interfering constructively. Questions? When you get to Lagrangian mechanics and the principle of least action, the thing that Dr. Botana Alcalde will deal with is called the Lagrangian. And although it's not at all obvious, the Lagrangian is basically the phase of a quantum mechanical wave function. In classical physics, where you don't have to deal with waves, you don't have to worry about the fact that technically particles are spreading out like waves. Classical physics is where you can ignore all of that. Well, that's because you're zoomed out, you're only seeing the places where everything added up constructively. And so the principle of least action, again, means that 
the phase was minimized, okay? So that for that path and all of the nearby adjacent paths, everything took the same amount of time. So you're only seeing all of the paths that can interfere with each, with each other constructively, the ones that are near a maximum or minimum, so that the derivative of phase is zero. Change a little bit, you still have the same phase, add up constructively. Those are the paths that manifest classically. We won't deal with any more quantum mechanics in here until the very end. All right, well, this principle of least time has applications above and beyond just deriving Snell's law. Um, for starters, it helps us understand um, elliptical mirrors. Consider an ellipse, it has two foci. And if I drew this correctly, then the basic property of an ellipse is that no matter which of these paths we take, the distance covered will be the same. So if I go by this path, I probably didn't draw it correctly, but if I had drawn it correctly, the distance here plus the distance here would be equal to this distance plus this distance, would be equal to this distance plus this distance, all right? Well, if all of those paths take the exact same amount of time, then technically they're all the path of least time. And if they're all the path of least time, then any of them could get you from A to B, which means all of them will get you from A to B. And so in some experiments, people will try to collect light. Does they do this if there are very faint signals? They'll essentially put their light source or the experimental sample that's emitting a very faint light signal at one focus of an elliptical mirror, uh, ellipsoidal mirror, and their detector at the other focus of an ellipsoidal mirror. And that way, all of the light will get from source to detector. I've heard of people doing things like this with ultrasound. Um, if they want to break up a kidney stone, they'll put, and I don't know how often this is used. I heard about it a long time ago. But the basic idea is that all of the sound waves will go from the source to the, the to the kidney stone, no matter which path they take, and so you can efficiently channel all of the energy to the kidney stone. A, uh, a more amusing version of this is that somewhere in the Capitol building, there is a, an elliptical room, okay? In one of the main public areas of the Capitol building, there's an elliptical room, or at least there was, it's been pillaged by barbarians, who knows what happened to it. But prior to barbarians pillaging the Senate, something that hasn't happened since Roman days, there was an elliptical room. And you could stand at one focus of the ellipse and somebody standing at the other focus of the ellipse will hear anything you say, even if you whisper. Because no matter which segment of the walls, the light, the sound, excuse me, the sound hits, it'll bounce off that segment of the wall to the other focus. And when I took a tour of the Capitol like 20 years ago, um, the tour guide, there's all these stories which the tour guides deny that supposedly a member of Congress was standing at one focus of the ellipse and depending on which version of the story you hear, the member of Congress may have been talking to a lover, may have been talking to someone offering a bribe, may have been talking to a former spy, to not a not former spy, a foreign spy. And they were giving, they were saying something that they shouldn't have been saying either to their illicit lover or their spy or the person who's giving them a bribe. And then someone else was standing at the other focus of the ellipse. And depending on which version of the story you hear, the person listening in might be a political enemy, they might be a journalist, they might be a foreign spy listening in on secrets. Every version of the story is different. The tour guides deny all of these versions. So who knows? The tour guides insist that this has never, ever happened. I don't quite believe that you can have a building with that much intrigue in it and not at some point have someone say the wrong thing in a place where everyone can hear it, but who knows. Um, but you can verify this. You can go to the Capitol building on a tour. Well, nowadays tours are shut down because of COVID, but 
when it's open for tours, the tour guides will have you stand at one of those and they'll stand at the other and they'll whisper something and you'll hear every word of it. Any questions? Okay. Well, we can use this fact for more than just jokes about the Capitol building or a few niche applications in ultrasound and detection of faint light. Let's look at a lens. Here's the basic shape of a lens. It's an axis through the middle of the lens. And the whole point of a lens is that you take light from a source at point A and it gets focused to point B. And no matter what point it starts off from, it, where, sorry, no matter which path it takes, it will go from A to B. All of these paths will get your light from A to B. That's the purpose of a lens. But from what we know about Snell's law, sorry, not about Snell's law, about Fermat's principle of least time, what can we say about these different paths? They all take the same amount of time. They have to take the same amount of time. And geometrically, we can see why, all right? So here we've got air, the fast medium. So this top path is covering a long distance, but it's covering most of that distance in the fast medium. This bottom path is covering a shorter distance, but it's covering a significant portion of that distance in the slow medium. And that's the whole idea of a lens. You go up farther and you're covering more distance, but you're covering most of that distance in the fast medium. So you don't actually take any more time. You go lower, you're covering less distance, but you're covering a lot of it in the slow medium, the glass. So you're still taking the same amount of time. Any questions on that idea? That's really cool. I didn't think about that. <laughs> That's exactly how lenses work, at least an ideal lens. Now it turns out that real lenses, they almost never take exactly the same amount of time, but they take very close to the same amount of time. And so real lenses don't give you exactly perfect focus, but they give you close to perfect focus. Most of the light gets pretty close to the point that they're supposed to hit because they take, they would, if they actually went from point A to point B, they would take almost the same amount of time. That's the whole idea of a lens. And we can use this fact, not just qualitatively, like I did now to say, oh, look, higher up paths, longer distance, most of it in fast medium, axial paths, this is called the optic axis. So anything that's on or near the axis will be called paraxial. Axial meaning on the axis and par from the same root word as peri, which in a lot of medical terminology, they'll say that, um, that the oxygen is highest in the perivascular region, meaning that it is uh, highest in the region near the blood vessel. Or they'll say this was a periorbital injury, meaning that this injury happened very close to the orbit or the eye socket. They'll say pericardial, that means that it's on the edge of the heart. Um, so para, it's like a periscope on a submarine. A periscope is looking at the immediate surroundings of a submarine. Kind of an etymology geek. Another fascinating fact is that lens comes from the same root word as lentil because a lentil bean looks a lot like a lens. Anyway, so. Is there a measure of efficacy for lenses? And what are like typical values? 
there are many measures of efficacy, but the problem is that coming up with an a measure of efficacy runs into the fact that most lenses work really well for the paraxial rays and they work not as well for the off-axis rays. So to say that the lens is working well, we need to say which rays were we looking at? How wide, how wide open was the aperture? Aperture is just a fancy word for opening from the same root word as abierto in Spanish. Anyway, um, so I can't give you a measure of efficacy, but when we get to aberration theory, I will give you several measures of efficacy and we'll look at how much worse things get as we widen the lens. Cool. Other questions? All right, so we could try to use the principle of least time to derive a lens shape. We'll start off by doing something even simpler than a lens. We'll just go from point A in air, not even air, we'll just say a medium N1. Maybe it's water, could be something else. To point B in a medium with index N2, presumably glass. And what we could say is we'll, we'll say that point A is a distance um, S1 from the lens. And point B is a distance S2. And so we know that any ray, any ray that's gonna go from point A to point B, the time going from A to B must be N1 S1 over C plus N2 S2 over C because it's, this distance S1 divided by C over N plus this distance S2 divided by C over N. And dividing by one over N is the same as multiplying by N. We could characterize this surface. If we say that here's the origin, then when we are a distance Y from the axis, we have gone inward a distance X. And so if we looked at another path, this path, well, we would say L1 is the square root of Y squared plus, and now it's not S1. It's S1 plus X. And L2 is the square root of Y squared plus, and now it's not S2, now it's S2 minus X. And so we could use Fermat's principle. We could say N1, L1 plus N2, L2 over C equals N1, S1 plus N2, S2 over C. And we could plug in the square roots. I'll plug them in, but we're not gonna go very far with those because that tedious algebra doesn't actually get you very far for reasons that well, for a number of reasons. I will plug it in. We'll go a little ways with it later if we have time. So I'll plug it in just for, just in case. All right, so at this point we could say, well, can we solve for y in terms of x? Uh, we're gonna have to solve a fourth order equation. It turns out that this fourth order equation is solvable. 
It's a bloody god awful mess. But we could go into ZMAX and implement it. There is a way to implement that in ZMAX. Um, the problem is that so far all I've done is derive the equation for one surface. I've taken light from say air to glass. But I really wanna take light through two surfaces. And so there's a way to combine two surfaces like that. Um, it's messy. I'm not sure we'll have the time to get to it, but I'll just show you the result in ZMAX. I'm gonna share the screen on my other machine where I have ZMAX running. If you look at the file called Cartesian Ovals, the file name is Cartesian Ovals because it turns out that these shapes are called Cartesian Ovals, right? In the lens data, I specify radii of curvature for the two surfaces. I specify a thickness for the lens. And then I specify a whole bunch of other parameters. I specify something called a conic constant. I specify something called U1 and V1. And this surface, rather than being a sphere, is called a superconic surface, right? And I'm not gonna make you do a project on superconics, but if you're curious about superconics, ZMAX's help files actually have some discussion of superconics. And on Blackboard, I included a file, um, a Mathematica file that runs through, where is it, Cartesian Ovals Notebook that runs through how to do superconic calculations. It's all very messy. But if we specify all of these parameters for a Cartesian oval, we get perfect focus of this axial point. And we can verify that it's perfect because we could zoom in. We could see they come to a point. Then we could zoom in again and see if they come to a point. And I have to zoom in several times before they don't come to a point. And it's basically, and they're not coming to a point on a scale of less than a thousandth of a centimeter, all right? So on a scale of a few microns, which is several wavelengths, which is in a regime where none of these calculations are strictly valid anyway. And basically it's because I didn't specify this to enough decimal places. But we noticed something, this off axis point also sent a bunch of rays through the lens. Those don't even look close to being focused. And you might think, well, geez, did you do something wrong? Well, did we design this lens to take all those rays from an off axis, from an off -axis point on the left to an off axis point on the right? No, the user didn't ask for that. We did all those calculations and arrived at a Cartesian oval for a point on the optic axis. If you go back into the notes, and I'll switch screens in a minute, everything that we said is, how do we make it so that all paths from this on-axis point to this other on-axis point take the same amount of time? That's all we ever said. It works perfectly for that. But it doesn't work so well for the off-axis points. It gets worse. First layer thickness, four centimeters. The last layer thickness, about eight centimeters, all right? It turns out that if you look at the formula for the Cartesian oval, S1 and S2 are parameters in there. You know, when I wrote down that formula, S1 and S2 show up in there. So this shape was designed for a particular choice of S1 and a particular choice of S2. Let's change that layer thickness. If we change that layer thickness, it looks like we're doing something good. I mean, hey, all the rays of light are coming to a focus. They're not coming to a focus here, but they're coming to a focus somewhere. That looks promising, except we zoom in and they're not coming to a focus at a single point. The thing is blurred. So it turns out the Cartesian ovals, although they do indeed work perfectly for one pair of points, 
they don't work perfectly for anything else. They work about as well as the approximate spherical lenses that we're going to get to in a little bit. And then we're gonna spend most of the semester working with. And so Fermat's principle is great for understanding the, um, the mechanism for why a lens work. And it's even great for deriving the shape of a perfect lens for a particular case. But going beyond that, what we do with Fermat's principle is that we just try to, um, we try to approximate the Cartesian oval. We know that the Cartesian oval is perfect for a particular choice of points. And from there, we try to approximate the Cartesian oval with spheres. And we approximate the Cartesian oval with spheres for two reasons. One, spheres are easier to work with mathematically than Cartesian ovals. You could say, well, all right, fine. They're easier to work with mathematically, but who says they're any good? Well, two, they have a tremendous manufacturing advantage. Grinding spherical shapes is way easier than grinding um, Cartesian oval shapes because a sphere, by definition, just has a uniquely defined radius, okay? If I, sw sw I don't wanna switch, I'll switch back for a sec. Spheres have the same radius of curvature everywhere. Everything, pretend I drew this well, everything is the same distance from the center. So if I take a shape and I twist it, I can grind something to a sphere pretty easily. People have been grinding spheres for a very, very long time. Grinding spheres is easy. Whereas the Cartesian oval does not have a uniform radius of curvature. It has a different curvature at different points. It is much harder to manufacture. And since it's much harder to manufacture and it only really has a strong advantage for one particular pair of points, not for off axis points and not for some other pair of on axis points, there hasn't been a huge interest in making them. Now nowadays, people are starting to make Cartesian ovals and things like them because after centuries of optical design, what we call aspherical, just a Greek rooted way of saying non-spherical surfaces are becoming easier to manage. With computerized manufacturing, now we can make aspheres cost effectively. But before computerized manufacturing, A spheres were very, very difficult to make. And so they would only be used in highly specialized applications for customers with very, very um, large bank accounts, deep pocketed customers. Now with computerized manufacturing, A spheres are becoming easier to make. And so you will see more people making and selling and buying A spheres. But spheres are still the easiest to make. Any questions? So what you should take away at this point is that if we spend a lot of time talking about spheres, it's not just to make the math easier for class. We're actually talking about the shapes that centuries of manufacturing were capable of handling, the shape that centuries of engineering expertise have been built up around, and a shape that even to this day is still the easiest to make in many cases. And by the way, a lot of the, the cheapest A-sphere manufacturing that I have seen has been for polymer optics, plastic optics. And polymer optics has its own issues. Polymer optics is absolutely great for many, many things. Don't get me wrong. I have friends who make polymer optics. I'm not putting them down. But for certain things that involve polarization of light, it is still the case that glass is better than polymers. Okay, so where am I? Now, let's talk about a simpler case. Actually, you know, we got the ZMAX file open. Let's play with it. Um, let me share my other screen. 
let's just play with it. Let's go back. Let's, uh, let's see, all right, it's one thing to, let's go back to the case we initially designed it for. So let's go into the lens data. Let's make this distance four. Let's talk about the spot diagram. The spot diagram tab might be present on your um, file, or it might not have been present when you opened it. If it's not, go to analyze, raise and spots, standard spot diagram. I've already got one open, so I don't need to. What a spot diagram shows is basically a cross-sectional view, a, a tilted view, 90 degrees tilted, of the layout. If you look at this here, we're looking at the lens from the side, and we're looking at all of the rays from the side. Well, the rays are hitting a surface, okay? Imagine turning that surface and looking at it and seeing how they're spread out on that surface. That's what the spot diagram is. And we see that for the off-axis object, and you're saying, why is it two degrees? And the answer is that the field, that off field is just another word for off-axis object, was specified that way. It was specified as being two degrees off-axis. If I had specified it as two centimeters off-axis, well, if I specified it as two centimeters off-axis, we'd have a bloody god-awful mess that doesn't get focused. So I specified it as 0 0.5 centimeters off axis. We still have a bloody god awful mess. But the point is that we can, the um, point is that, let's bring it back on axis. She knows two things in the spot diagram. The spot diagram, for the on-axis object, the thing that's zero centimeters off axis, is a point. And we zoom in, and it's still a point. And you say, no, it's not, it's a circle. Well, all those points are contained within that circle. And you could say, what is this circle? This circle is called the airy disk, something we're gonna to get to in the second half of the semester. For now, all you need to know about the airy disk is that the airy disk represents the resolution limit of an absolutely perfect, well, a, of a lens that's as perfect as you can make for waves. We're gonna learn in the second half of the semester that if you try to focus light down to a perfect point, even with the Cartesian oval, the fact that light is a wave gets in the way. You can't confine all of the energy in a wave to a spot of zero radius. And I have this set up to draw the airy disk. And for now, all we need to know is that if all of your points are coming closer together than the airy disk, then the, the theory of geometrical optics is predicting something that's better than the physical universe could deliver. So clearly you're, you've done, you have a good design. It's not actually gonna work as well as you think, but it's at the performance limit. The off-axis point, doesn't look anything like that. In fact, it looks like a comet. And this is an example of something we're gonna learn about called coma aberration. Coma being from the same root word as comet because it looks like a comet. Try playing with that off-axis distance, right? When you play with the off-axis distance, well, in this diagram, it got blown up and you think, hey, that got worse rather than better. But look at the RMS radius of it down here. Look at the spot size. Right now, if it's 0.1 centimeters off axis, spot size is 236 microns. If it was 0.2, the spot size is 475 microns. And it just looks smaller because of the way the drawing got rescaled. Try going smaller still. And as you go smaller still, the spot size gets smaller. All right. What you should take away from that is that the performance depends on how far off axis you are. This is an elaboration on my answer earlier. Is there a figure of merit? Well, there is, but that figure of merit depends on whether we're dealing with paraxial rays, which if you look at this layout here, these two things, these two points are very close. One of them's on axis and the other one is close to the axis. 
or whether we're dealing with non-paraxial rays. It also depends on, we'll talk in the second half of class today about how we measure this aperture size. But for now, just, just make the aperture narrower and see what happens. Just change that number, whether it's an entrance pupil diameter or something else, just cut it in half and see what happens. When you cut it in half, you see both on the layout, the side view, that this looks smaller. We can verify that by going back up again. Definitely looks like it got focused to a smaller spot when we cut it in half and a larger one when we doubled it. The spot diagram also gets smaller. Right now it's 62.8. If I double it, it's 236. Questions? Um, was it already mentioned as to, let's say, I guess, how you determine if your rays are paraxial or not? Um, like near to what degree? Okay, so yeah, how close is close and how far is far? Yeah. Um, the best answer is that we call it paraxial if we can make a Taylor series approximation to sine theta. If sine theta is close to theta, mean that sine theta is equal to theta in radians within, say, 10%, then it's probably paraxial. If sine theta differs from theta by more than you know, roughly 10%, then it's definitely non-paraxial. In practice, if sine theta is 0.1 or 0.2, then you're probably fine. But beyond that, you start to notice some deviations. Okay. Other questions on this? All right, then let's go back to paper and pencil math. So let's take a simpler case. Let's suppose that we have a lens with the property that, well, I didn't want that, let's draw freehand. Right. We have a lens with the property that if something is one, is at this point, which we call the focal point, And when light hits the lens, it will go parallel to the axis. Now it turns out that all lenses have a point where if you put the, uh, if you put a point source of light at that point, on the other side, it will go parallel to the axis. But we're going to deal with the case where not only does it go parallel to the axis once it exits the lens, but it actually goes parallel at the first surface. I have a different kind of lens, then it might not go perfectly parallel to the, to the axis when it enters the lens. Upon entering, it might still be going a little bit at a slight angle with respect to the axis, but once it goes through the other side, then it goes parallel to the axis, all right? So we can have a lens like that, but it's easier in this case. And the reason it's easier in the first case is because of something I had you work out on the homework. What I had you work out on today's homework was that, what if I have my object my lens, and then we go to a point far out. What you should have found is that if these rays are almost parallel to each other, theta is small, 
then the path lengths are almost the same. Right? So as the limit that theta goes to Right? Even though L1 and L2 get huge, if I were to extend this way far off the screen, somewhere beyond what I can draw in Zoom, all right, if I were to extend it way far off the screen, beyond what I can draw, it would still be, uh, it would be the case that these two paths were essentially the same. And the more parallel we make them, the uh, closer they get to being exactly the same. Which means that everything on the right side, if they're going parallel or very, very, very close to parallel to each other, everything on the right side is guaranteed to be the same distance. So all I have to worry about is the stuff on the left side of the lens and inside the lens. And furthermore, if I wanted to go parallel to the axis, once it's passed through this flat surface here, and I'm stipulating that this is flat, how do you get something to go parallel to the axis when it hits a flat surface? How do you get something, if, assuming that the axis is perpendicular to the surface, how do I get something to go perpendicular to the surface once it's passed through the surface? Think about Snell's law. What should theta be? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. You you want the beam to be to come out normal? Normal, yeah. Did I say parallel or did I say perpendicular? You said parallel, I think. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I meant perpendicular. How do I get something to go perpendicular to the surface? Okay, so so same as the direction of like that axial line, right? Yep. Just okay, just making sure. Uh, wouldn't it have to be 90? You no. have to be going perpendicular to the surface already. Um, Sign theta would be zero. Zero. Yep. Yes. Theta would be zero, which means 90 would be the parallel case. Yeah, right. 90 would be parallel to the surface. So theta equals zero here. What that means is that if this distance I call F and this distance I call D, the thickness, the thickness at the center. Well, let's just figure out the time that each ray took. Okay, if we call this x, we call this y, then what we've got is that this would be f minus d plus x. And so this would be this, this length here, this hypotenuse would be the square root of y squared plus f minus d plus x, whole thing squared. So the time to reach the flat surface, the time to go like this, and then like that, would have to be N1 L1 over C plus N2 D minus X because this distance here is D minus X. It's the center thickness minus how far in it's bulged. N2 D minus X over C. Questions on how I set that up?
The whole idea is this. A concept that keeps coming up in optics is object at infinity, image at infinity. Now, of course, we don't ever really image something at infinity. Even telescopes are imaging things that are a measurable distance away. But once something is many focal lengths away, say 100 focal lengths away, then all of those paths are essentially parallel. So you're just talking about something so far away that we can treat the angle between two paths as being zero. It's never exactly zero, but it's very close to zero, okay? And as we take something farther and farther away, then all of these paths are essentially parallel to each other. They essentially take the same amount of time. So all of the delays are over here on the left, which means we just have to make sure that this plus this takes the same amount of time as the axial path. And the axial path takes a time, well, let's see here, N1 times F minus D over C plus N2 D over C. And I could rewrite that. I'll just cancel out the C so we don't have to keep dealing with that. As N1 square root of, what was it? Y squared plus F minus D plus X squared plus N to D minus X equals N one F minus D plus N two D. All right, where do we go from there? Well, one thing we could do is we could solve this equation to get y in terms of x or x in terms of y and specify the lens shape. And if we did that, we would get a hyperbola because basically we would move this term over to the right and then we would square both sides and we'd wind up with something that has y squared terms, just some y squared on the left and also some x and x squared terms on the left. And on the right, we'd have a bunch of x squared terms and if you do all of the algebraic manipulation, you get a hyperbola. Now, ZMAX can handle hyperbolas. And so I have created a file called Hyperbolic Thin Lens. And if you look at the layout in that file, Again, the lens data sheet specifies the distance from the object to the first lens surface, that thickness. I'm going to tile the windows. All right. We specify this first layer thickness, the 10 is from here to there. The 2.1 is from here to there. The 19.996 is from here to there. And we've set it up so that the axial point, all of those rays go exactly parallel to the axis inside the lens. So we've basically taken two different lenses and we've put them together, all right? We've got a lens with focal length F1 on the left and a lens with focal length F2 on the right and we squeeze them together. And the first lens takes all those rays from one focal length away and it sends them parallel to the axis. And the second lens says, hey, I'm getting some rays that are going parallel to the axis. So it sends them to its focal point. Any questions? Um, sorry, could you clarify again uh, 
Well, what about the lens is hyperbolic? The, the shape is hyperbolic. It doesn't necessarily look like it. It looks, uh -huh. the way we know it's hyperbolic is because I specified something called a conic constant. There are many ways of writing out the shapes for hyperbolas. One of them is in terms of something called a conic constant, which is the way that ZMAX does it. I'm not going to explain in detail what a conic constant is because it's different from how you did in high school math, probably, where you probably talked about eccentricity. And in practice, people almost, I won't say never, but I will say rarely make hyperbolic lenses. I'm showing what happens with the ideal lenses, and then I'm showing that even the ideal lenses only work for the on-axis point. Does that answer your question? So this hyperbolic um, lens is basically the product of us, um, let's see, trying to, I guess, find the parameters of, of a of some ideal lens that would give us those parallel rays, right? Basically. Okay. So if we were to extrapolate these surfaces out farther, if I were to make these lenses much wider, then we could start to see that maybe these are not spherical. These start to look like deviations from spheres. They start to look like hyperbolas. But near the center of a hyperbola, near the axis, near the center of a hyperbola, it doesn't look any different from a segment of a circle or a segment of a sphere. Right. And so we can approximate hyperbolas with spheres. And we're going to get to that in a minute. Um, what else do I want to say about this? I just want to say that it shows the same pathologies that we saw for the Cartesian oval, where the off-axis point doesn't come to a focus. Other questions? All right, so the last thing I wanna do is I wanna show that we can approximate things with, a, with spheres, okay? Because I've derived this equation and now I want to show that this equation gives me um, sphere, this equation can give me spheres. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to assume essentially that the lens is thin. Thin lens means a few things. It means D goes to zero, right? It means that X is small. So X squared is really small. All right, I'm gonna make that thin lens approximation. X is small, so X squared is really small. Well, that means I can do the following in my equation. I can rewrite this as N1 square root of Y squared plus F plus X squared minus N2X equals N1 F. Okay, and I feel like I did something. Well, no, it won't matter. It won't, it won't. Um, it shouldn't matter. Yeah, I think something might matter here. Let's take a look. Okay, so this distance would be D minus X. Okay. 
We'll worry about that later. All right, let's, let's make one more step. N1 square root y squared plus f squared plus 2fx plus x squared equals n2 plus n1f. Now, what can I say about x squared compared with f squared or fx? What can I say about that? given my thin lens approximation. Well, we said that x squared is really small, right? So is it negligible? Yep. Negligible. All right, so then what I can do I'm sorry, did is you I can square to... both sides of this. And I get that n1 squared times y squared plus f squared plus 2fx. On the right hand side, we factored out an f from n2, but I think that factor has a, an x. Ah, all right, that explains it. n1f plus n2x. Okay. Thank you. Now, I can also get rid of the x squared on the right side. And so I'm left with n1 squared y squared plus n1 squared f squared plus 2n1 squared fx equals n... That should have been... No, that's, that's all right. N1 squared, F squared, plus 2, N1, N2, Fx. And we can cancel this, cancel that. They tweeted something terrible, so they're canceled. Okay, where do we go from there? Well, I've been talking about how I want to approximate hyperbolas with spheres. And one thing I had you do on the homework was show that the radius of curvature is related to the second derivative. One over R is equal to second derivative if we're at a minimum or maximum. Strictly speaking, the absolute value of the second derivative at a minimum or a maximum. Okay, that's what we showed on the homework. Now, that means that if we take second derivatives of everything, we should be able to relate focal length to radius of curvature. But we have to be a little bit careful. If, if we were approximating, if we had a shape that was oriented vertically, the idea is that this shape may be whatever complicated thing. It could be a Cartesian oval. It could be a, um, a hyperbola, an ellipse, a parabola, whatever it may be. But because, but at, at, that, um, at that minimum, yeah, near that minimum point, we could, yeah, I'm not like, yeah, I'm just gonna do this by hand. Near that minimum point, we could draw a circle that for a while matches it. Eventually the circle fails to match it, but down here it matches it very closely. Here we have a circle that almost matches a 
more complicated shape. And one over R is equal to D squared Y DX squared. That was the idea on the homework. But now we turn it around because up in this diagram, we don't have Y of that. We don't have something that's curved vertically, that's bulging vertically. We have something that's bulging horizontally. So something's bulging horizontally, then we could again approximate it with a sphere. But now this is x of y. Here you've got y of x. Here, the way we've specified it, x is a function of y. And so 1 over r is d squared x dy squared. So you showed on the homework that the rate that 1 over the radius is equal to the second derivative. Now I'm just flipping it around, swapping the variables because we swapped the orientation. And so I'm going to take the second derivative of this thing with respect to y. So I'm going to bring that down. I'm going to take d squared by dy squared of n1 squared y squared plus 2n1 squared fx equals 2, sorry, d squared by dy squared 2n1 n2 fx. Let's see here, the second derivative of y squared with respect to y, the second derivative, the first derivative of y squared would be 2y. If I take the derivative of that of 2y with respect to y, I get 2. So I get 2n1 squared plus 2n1 squared f That's 1 over r equals 2n1 n2 f. That's 1 over r again. And let's see, what can we cancel here? We can cancel some twos. We can cancel one factor of n1. And we are left with n1 plus n1 f over r equals n2 f over r. Or n1 equals n2 minus n1 f over r or let's divide both sides by n1 we are left with f equals r over n2 over n1 minus 1 or 1 over f is n2 over n1 minus 1 over r. And I suspect some people probably want to take a moment to write. So we'll take a moment to write, then I'll interpret it. And then we'll switch to some Zmax time for next Tuesday's assignment. Because once we have this focal length, then we're good to start talking about thin lenses next week or talk more about lenses next week. Take a moment, write what you need to write. Does anybody need more time? All right, hearing no objections. What should we take away from this? Well, first of all, 
1 over the focal length depends on the refractive index contrast. So let's, let's test this. I'm going to, right now we have two hyperbolic lenses. I'm going to get rid of one of these hyperbolas. How can I make the right side? Let me go back. I forgot I got to switch screens. All right, how can I make the right side flat? How can um, I make a circle? You change its radius? To what? Um, it's to a plane, so infinity. Infinity, yep. All right, so we make the radius, the radius of curvature infinity. Now, let's see here. So we've got, we clearly have an object at the focal point, all right? It must be at the focal point because it's taking all these rays of light that are coming from a point object and it's sending them parallel to the axis. And if we widen our aperture, to let's say still works, okay? So qualitatively, we clearly have something at focal point. Let's see if that's working. Um, our formula was that one over the focal length is N2 over N1 minus one over the radius. And I'm gonna turn on my annotation. Well, let's see here. The radius of curvature is six. And N2 minus N, N2 over N1. We need to figure out what N2 over N1 is. Well, it's in air, okay? It starts off in air, so N1 is one. And N2 is the refractive index of the glass. Now, how are we going to get the refractive index of the glass? Um, Can we look up the material? Yeah, we would want to look up the material. So we would go to libraries, material analysis, dispersion diagram. And then we would need to see, we've got F5 glass, which I chose more or less on a lark. Some people, when they go into ZMAX, they'll say, hey, wait, I did a dispersion diagram and it gave me whatever number, but you have to look. And by default, it goes in alphabetical order through the catalog. So we have to go with F5 glass. And I'm actually kind of wasting time because I already put it in the file, but I wanted to show you the process for getting it. And then you could say, okay, well, here's the refractive index. Oh no, it depends on wavelength. Well, we've already got that here, so I'll just use that. We have to figure out which wavelength we're using. And there's a setting in ZMAX under System Explorer. We can ask it what the wavelength is. And right now it's only using one wavelength, 0.55 microns the middle of the visible range. So I could zoom in on 0.55 microns and we see that the refractive index is probably 1.607. 1 1.607 minus one, that's gonna be 0 0.607 over six centimeters. 0 0.6 over six is about one over, sorry, it's about 0 0.1 over one centimeter equals one over F. So F would be one centimeter over 0 0.1 or 10 centimeters. 
which would mean that we have to see, okay, if I've got something 10 centimeters away from the lens, then I should be at the focal point. Which parameter is going to tell us whether or not our object is 10 centimeters away from the lens surface? What parameter? Where are we going to look in this file? Any guesses? What parameter tells us the distance from here to there? By the way, ZMAX also has its own annotation tools. What parameter is going to give us this distance? It's the thickness between an object and the first stop entry, I think. And sure enough, that is 10 centimeters. Now, any questions on that? Can you go over what that one um, option was uh, as an alternative to like a fixed salt type um, versus a pickup? Oh, um, like over here, usually for the clear sum of diameter, if I wanted this surface and this surface to have the same thickness, Sorry, the same right. semi-diameter. That's the place where I use it most frequently, although there are others. I would go here and instead of fixed, fixed is not denoted F, it's denoted U, meaning user defined. I'd switch it to pick up and I'd say, let's pick it up from, uh, from surface one. By default, everything picks up from the starting point, zero. I would tell it go to surface one. And then if I change that later, it would automatically change with it. Oops, I did the wrong one. And that's a little too big. And that's pretty much perfect. Last thing before we switch to next Tuesday's project, we don't have time to go over the quantitative detail, but if we look at this ray that's hitting the edge of the lens, it's making a pretty big change of direction going from, but it goes from air to glass and it goes from air to glass at a steep angle. We know that when, there's, when something's coming in at a steep angle and sees a big change in refractive index, it makes a big change in angle. That comes from Snell's law. What if instead of having it coming from air, I had it coming from water? What do you, before I hit enter and we find out, what do you think would happen? Do you think it would change angle by as much, by more, or by little, by less? By less. <laughs> Anyone disagree? Sorry, could you repeat the question? If we replace air with water, will the change in angle be the same as it was going from air to glass? Will it be larger than it was going from air to glass or will it be smaller than it was going from air to glass? Um, the, the angle we're, sorry, what's the angle that we're talking about specifically? The change in the direction. Right now we've got this, if I just look at this uh, outermost ray here, this mm -hmm. oh going from the that the water medium to into the lens yeah going from water to glass instead of air to glass well now by oh, accident whoa. i hit enter oh, okay. and we see that there's a much smaller change <laughs> so it doesn't all get collimated that's all i'm going to say about lenses for today um the main takeaways are that we could use Fermat's principle to derive Snell's law. We could use Fermat's principle to derive the lens shape. And then once we had an equation for a lens shape, we were able to derive a relationship uh, between focal length and radius of curvature and refractive index. 
Next time we'll talk more about that. We'll derive the thin lens equation and then we'll try a bunch of different cases involving lenses. But for now, I want you to go into the assignment that's due on Tuesday, which you hopefully looked at between Tuesday, last Tuesday and today, and make use of the ZMAX file, first day flat surface, because that's going to have everything that you need in order to, that's the file that you should be working from. And I will create some breakout rooms so that you can go talk to each other or we can all just stay in one breakout room, however you prefer. I'll create some smaller rooms. You can either switch to those or stay in here, whichever you prefer. Um, supposedly you were able to, someone said that you should be able to self-assign to breakout rooms with the new version of Zoom, but I'm not seeing that. So I'm not going to do that, but I want you to work with first day flat surface and I'm going to open up that file as well. And this is, for the next 20 minutes, basically an office hour. You typed in water to access the material for water. Um, did you just know that? You know, where are the other ones somewhere to be found in the catalog? I wasn't able to find like uh, more colloquial ones like air, water, you know, whatever else there might be. It only knows a handful of things other than manufactured glass. Water is one of the few. I mean, we can find out what's in the miscellaneous library. My follow up question was, is there an ability for us to sort of like create our own materials or not that like, you know, I claim we're qualified to do anything like that, but if it was just a dumb graph that was kept, you know, kept a constant index of refraction over all wavelengths or something. Um, yeah, there is a way. Um, I've always erred on the side of realism, but I know that there are ways to add things to a ZMAX catalog. You can create a custom catalog. The miscellaneous catalog has acrylic. It has, I don't know why it has BASF things in here. BASF is a chemical company. Why don't they just have the BASF catalog? Um, calcium fluoride. I'm thinking this is probably, or is this, Oh, BASF5. Is that the BA, is that the chemical company BASF? Because I'm looking at these other things. And I'm sure that CAF2, since everything is capitalized, I'm sure that CAF2 is calcium fluoride. That A is supposed to be lowercase. And then I'm guessing that CDS is cadmium sulfide. And I'm not sure what COC is. Is that cobalt carbonate or? That's the only thing I can think of. CR39, I'm guessing that's chromium, but, oh, well, it gives a source. Optical plastics, okay. So whatever CR39 is, it's from an article on plastics. Source, like in lens design. KDP, um, but, no. I'm guessing this is lanthanum fluoride, but that's just a guess. 
Oh, there you go. N15, N1.5, simulated glass with an index of 1.5 at all wavelengths between min wave and max wave. PMMA, that's polymethyl methacrylate. This is polycarbonate, polystyrene, Pyrex. Again, I wonder why they, py, why they have Pyrex rather than the Dow Corning catalog. Sand. Good to know, seawater. Yeah. Uh, so light isn't, or not, sorry, not light, um, air isn't in the miscellaneous? catalog? Um, At least for me, I, I can't see it. Yeah, it looks like they just treat air as vacuum. Oh, okay. Seawater as opposed to regular water, silica, um, TO2, I assume that's tellurium oxide type a, I have no idea what type A is. But N15. Anyway, now I'm curious to look up the difference between seawater and regular water. But you can stop my play if you have questions. It doesn't look like there's much for like publicly available catalogs. If we say like wanted to extend our library or anything like that. There's got to be a way to load other catalogs because from ZMAX's perspective, they would, they would love it if you're able to bring in someone else's catalog. It makes it more likely to keep using your product, their product. So right. yeah, and it, there just doesn't seem to be a lot of publicly available ones <laughs> or at least a place to get them. I've got to remember how to change catalogs. To edit or review the data in the existing. Systems. Ah, there. Catalogs to use, catalogs available.
Okay. Now I can load. Seawater has a higher index, that makes sense. Okay, um, as you're working on this, you're gonna have to measure angles. Now there's two ways to measure some angles. One is of course, you're gonna have to measure some of them the hard way by looking over here and seeing where are the coordinates of this point and then moving and seeing where are the coordinates of the other point. But one thing you can do is you can specify the object cone angle, all right? That's one way to specify your aperture. You could decide that you want a cone of rays that's 10 degrees or you want a cone of rays that's 45 degrees or whatever you want it to be. You could also specify things by deciding that you want the entrance pupil diameter. The entrance pupil diameter decides what will the diameter be on the surface that your aperture stop, your limiting surface. And so this surface, surface two in the way I've set it up is the aperture stop. We know that because the word stop is there. And we go there and we see, all right, well, how high up is the outermost ray? It's about 10 centimeters from the axis. And the lowermost ray is about nine centimeters below the axis. So this distance is about 20. Now I can always make a different surface be the aperture stop. And I would say I want surface one to be able to go to surface one and I would click this little thing for surface properties. And I would say, make this the surface, make this surface the stop. We see that everything changes. The beam is expanded. And then you look over here and you see, all right, well, I'll put my cursor right up there. And the topmost ray hits the surface about 10 centimeters above the axis. And the lowermost ray hits about 10 centimeters below the axis. And so that's another way of specifying things. Another thing you might do is you might say, I want my object to be at the origin. So you go and you select the object surface and you make sure that you're in the surface properties thing. You say, make this the global coordinate reference. And now your origin is at this point because if I put my cursor there, I see that I've got horizontal coordinate roughly zero, vertical coordinate roughly zero if I have my cursor there. Any questions? Is there a way to annotate this diagram? Absolutely. There are tools in the layout window. So, and it puts the word object there. Now we'd have to 
probably want to change the aspect ratio of some things, but I'll do that by going to I'll exit that, go to setup, window options. If I just dock instead of tile. Then I can edit those annotations. It's not the nicest editor in the world. Um, but with a little bit of practice, you can get used to it. Generally, you should only annotate after you've got everything just right. Now, I've set this up so that my order is water, vacuum, BK7. So it starts off in water. It hits the air and it um, expands. But what if I change the object cone angle? start making the angles really large. So sine theta is around 50. Let's try 48. 48 point, oops, three, 48.5, 48.9. Somewhere around 48.9. See how this ray stops going? Can anybody guess why that ray isn't going from water to air? Total internal reflection. Total internal reflection. N sine theta is so big, 1.33 times the sine of 48.9 is so big that if I pull up my calculator app, which, where is it? So, oh, it's a new laptop. I didn't even put it on my desktop. So I go to, what is the scientific mode? Oops, 48.9, I see. Sorry, I always use a different calculator app. And then I multiply that by 1.33, and I get something just slightly larger than one. So sine theta two has to be one point, n sine theta two has to be 1.02. .02. Now n two is one. So what angle is going to give me a sine equal to 1.0022? It's um, out of range. What? That's out of range. Yeah, you can't, there's no angle that'll do that. So it can't enter that material. All right, it is about 650. If people want to keep working on it and maybe ask me a question, I'll stick around for a few more minutes if you want to stay logged in and see if you get to a point where you have a question. But if you need to go, that's perfectly fine. 
I'll have office hours on Monday afternoon and Tuesday morning and afternoon. I'll also be available by email tomorrow and over the weekend. So good luck playing around in ZMAX. Have a good day, Professor. You too. What does it mean uh, when it to make a, a surface a stop? It means that that's the surface that we're going to treat as limiting for all purposes. So um, the stop is the surface that you can think of it as the surface where we're putting something that would block the beam. All right, so imagine in some experiment, I set it up where besides having all of the things that you see in there, let me, well, I mean, we'll stick with this example and I'll just change the cone and I'll change the aperture is what I'm gonna do. Entrance pupil diameter, we're gonna make that like 10, all right. If I want to make, right now we have set which surface as the stop. We've set surface one as the stop. And so we've said that, all right, we're not going to let in any rays that are farther than five centimeters off axis because the diameter is 10. So the radius is five. We're not gonna let anything that's further than five centimeters off axis on this surface. And that just means that somebody's gone in and placed some obstruction on that surface. That's what it would mean experimentally. They place some circle with a little, some cir black circular disc with a little hole in it that has five centimeter diameter. If I had decided to make surface two the stop, that means I take off this blocking thing on surface one and I say, you know what, I'm going to put my five centimeter radius, 10 centimeter diameter blocking thing on surface two. And so now we're only going to consider rays that uh, make a cone with 10 centimeter diameter, five centimeter radius by the time they get to this surface. There could be other rays that are doing all sorts of things. There could be a ray that's going like that and then like that. But you know what, once it gets to this surface, it's blocked. So we don't care about it anymore. So changing the aperture value doesn't technically really like, um, doesn't change what's happening. It's just chain, changing like the amount of, uh, or the range of, of values that's showing us close. Yeah, it's changing the range of rays that you're going to analyze. Oh, okay. And very good reason to only analyze a certain range of rays is that in the real device that you're modeling, maybe somebody has either limited the input somehow, or they, they're going to, in the midst of all these other lenses and various other things, insert some kind of object that only lets through rays of such and such range at such and such surface. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. What does it mean when a surface has the APER versus not having anything in front of it for surface type? When a surface has a what? Uh, APER, like aperture, versus not having anything, like your surface one. Um, where did, oh, stop. That means it's the aperture stop. And then if it's like a blank layer that has APER? Oh, wait. Like that, yeah. Um, I should know this and I don't. That's a good question. I do not know the answer to that. Let's see if 
that does anything. No, that doesn't do anything. That is a good question that I don't have an answer to. Would one that says like aperture there versus a blank one have any impact or is it just something else? Let's find out. We got water, vacuum, BK7. Let's put, I don't know, F6 glass and we'll make it five. And let's just see what we've got there. Yeah, let me get rid of my image. They had some technical videos available. Um, and this is specifically for like sequential and there's three different types of services only, right? There's objects, stop and image. I was able to do the first part of the assignment using a bunch of empty objects. I, I wasn't able to do it using a bunch of empty stops. Um, and what I remember from the videos is that image is where measurements are taken if you configure something for that. Um, and then stops are what Dr. Small said earlier, like it's like a, it's a boundary. Um, but I, you know, that's after one video, I don't, I don't really, really know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> I have to be <laughs> honest, the way, the way I have, um, dealt with the, ah aperture type okay so i see that's something we get to specify in there you know what that's that's never a property that i've worried about um so i don't have i have to be honest the way i learned zmax is through trial and error and googling only when necessary so there are subtleties of what does it mean to call something an aperture? I think it means that the surface, in certain types of visualization, you would have an aperture drawn on the surface, like they would actually draw it in, draw. I think there must be some way with visualization that we could draw something blocking all the rays out beyond the edge of that, but that's just a guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, changing the um, the aperture changes the physical optics. If you look at the analyze tab, which I get that totally kind of makes sense, right? <laughs> uh, well, anyway, uh, thank you, Professor. See you. You're welcome. Okay, and then uh, one last one is I noticed on yours you have objects zero through or surfaces zero through three are all highlighted together, what does that represent? Um, I'm not sure why those are highlighted. Because let's go into my other file and see if it's like that. No, it's not like that. Again, this is something I should know, but I don't. There's sort of two very different ways that people explore programs. One is they say, what is that? I wanna see what it does. The other is, what do I need to do? Let's figure out how to do it. And I've been more of the second type, <laughs> to be honest. And that's part of why I don't always know each and every feature or what each and every highlighted thing means. Makes sense. Wait, can I see your settings again real quick for can you uh, see my what? Can I see your settings for Aperture 2 or for Surface 2? Oh, for Surface 2 here? Yeah. Because um, for some reason I can't change the Aperture type from floating Aperture to none. <laughs> floating Aperture. Well, there you have to, I think, go float by, by stop size. Uh, I mean, for the surface itself, like under the surface two, or, yeah, surface two properties under aperture, pretty much getting rid of the parentheses APR part. Oh, that means you can't do that. Either. Okay. Hmm. 
I have to be honest, for the kinds of questions I wanted to ask, I've never worried about it. Okay, good. That doesn't mean you shouldn't, shouldn't think about it. There's plenty of value in learning it, but there's two ways you learn how to use a program. Either you look at each piece of it and say, hey, what does that do? Or you look at it and say, how can I do what I want to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was... Go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, I was setting this up last night for the project. Um, mm -hmm. And I realized, however I set up the materials, which I cannot remember how I did it, it's they're stuck as the APR versus being like an empty object there. And then on mine, it's only surfaces one and two are selected in purple. I would worry for these purposes less about that setting and more about are the rays going to where you need them to go to so you can answer the question that you're trying to answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going to verify based off of, you know, because we do, we are able to get all the other information for Snell's Law, so I was just going to make sure that they add up correctly. And if it doesn't, then I'll go back at the settings. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I was just curious why it was like that. No, no problem. You're asking good questions. See you next week. Bye. Oh, also, actually, real quick, for the project, is there a certain format you want for it, like the report? Um, be neat. You know, show me the graph, show me the, show me the requested graphs and tables and put the answers to questions reasonably close to the tables. I'm not picky about that. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome.